Okay. Well, it's just to introduce uh, Tom Grimshaw, who's going to talk about good health then and now with some very interesting case studies and anecdotes. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. Oh, thanks for inviting me, everybody. Uh, I'm going to start. Um, at one time, I used to um, teach the history of medicine, and it was very much history as a moving escalator which was onwards and upwards. And it was all about how lucky we are and the massive progress that we have made. But on reflection, when I came to put this together, it, uh, I had far more respect for the hundreds of generations that lived before us. I mean, good health is central to the human condition. Uh, and I wanted to acknowledge their pain and grief and joy that they had lived through. And they were not necessarily that much less intelligent nor emotionally sensitive as the rest of us. Um, as you can see in the title there, that I'm going to give you some episodes of local history, which I found really interesting. But I'm going to ask for your reflections on some current topics on good health. Um, he's also, we're also recording all this. So when later I show you um, slides full of texts and figures, you can return to them at leisure and read them uh, more slowly. Some of the slides I found, I found really interesting and provocative. But we will need to move on. And I will be keeping an eye on the clock all the time. On the bottom left there, you can see the uh, engraving, Dura's engraving of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. As you know, war, plague, pestilence, famine. Uh, and if you find this quite historic and uh, antique and quaint, then I would suggest that you think again. If we think of those four horsemen, pestilence, well, we've all just lived through COVID and the way that our lives were turned upside down in COVID, which challenged our abilities to respond. Famine, climate change threatens to uh, whole expanses of Africa and Asia with famine. And the war in the Ukraine, we can see its effects very close to home when we choose to turn the fire on or when we go shopping. So I think we've got to beware arrogance of uh, our good fortune in living in the 21st century. <clears throat> now, as you can see from some of the other quotes, health is very much more than medicine. It is mind body and spirit. And if you're scouring these quotes here, you can see that uh, Epictetus, it takes more than just a good looking body, you've got to have the heart and soul to go with it. Mind, body, spirit. The same is echoed in the wisdom of Corinthians. Though outwardly we are wasting away day by day, yet inwardly we are being renewed. There's a lot more to us than pulse rates and blood pressure. And the others are just simply the effect of the environment. And down there, quite profound, your body hears everything your mind says. Stay healing. In reality, this has been medicine for 99% of human history. People have had no other choice. But again, don't just put it down as desperate and deluded. After all, if you visited Lourdes or any places of healing, you can see many uh, votive stones of thanksgiving for recoveries. And when you look into it, some of it is really, really interesting. This person up here is Asclepios, the Greek god of healing. Well, now, when you look at accounts of Asclepios, they built Asclepion, As Asclepions in the hillsides, in clean, fresh air, need clean water. 
and they had um, they had gyms attached. And the idea was it was virtually like um, a hospital ward, that you moved into the Sclepion, and they hoped that as you fell asleep, in your dreams you would be visited by the god and his serpents, you know, the sign of surgery today, there's his serpents, and his two daughters, Hygieia and Panakia, we say panacea, and there in the dream, you would either be cured or you would be given a prescription. And sometimes as you came round, the prescription was very much herbal in nature. So there was a vast knowledge of herbs. When you look at some of the other exhibits, that is Jesus and the daughter of Jairus. She is not dead, but sleeping. This is Imhotep, the Egyptian god of healing. And of course, much of the appeal of Buddhism was its uh, duty to participate in healing. So, again, underneath all the faith healing, there is very much a knowledge of herbs that goes back basically into prehistory, hundreds of centuries. And many of these herbs can uh, be found in the ancient texts, not only in the Islamic documents that were brought back from the Crusades, but even documents that go back into Egypt and ancient Greece. Um, and of course, in the Egyptian papyrus, they had trade routes to India and China. So you can't do history in boxes. It's basically a testimony to human enterprise and competence. And down there on the right, there is no uh, cathedral or monastery uh, worth its salt that did not have a herb garden. And if you visit many of the ancient cathedrals like Chartres, there is a herb garden still there, all preserving this empirical knowledge. Now, uh, these were some of the home remedies that were passed down and scientists have found uh, a basis for their, them being effective. Some of them do work for scientific reasons. So I'll leave you to uh, just glance down some of these. I'm sure you've used some of them yourself. Um, has anybody got any other one to offer that I may have overlooked? Most people okay. are muted, so they might not be able to respond very easily. Okay, fine. Well, when we I can, ask... We can press the space bar yes. if we want to talk. Yeah, you, uh, yeah good, good to remind people that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, there'll be more sort of formal appeals for contributions, and then uh, uh, maybe you could ask them to unmute. So... Those are remedies found out to work and passed on down the generations. Just a reminder of the good old days. These were the 1940s. I'm going to read what Kathleen Davis says. Headaches, we had vinegar and brown paper. The whooping cough, we had camphorated oil rubbed on our chests or goose fat. For months, stockings around our throats and measles, we had tea stewed in the teapot by the fire. All different kinds of home cures. They thought they were better than going to the doctors. Well, they couldn't afford the doctor because sixpence in those days was like looking at a £10 note today. And another witness said every doctor basically had their own collector. They used to come round every week and you'd pay sixpence. And my father and mother used to say they would never be straight in their lifetime. Can I and just say about that nursery rhyme, Tom? Vinegar and brown paper, Jack and Jill went up the hill. I didn't know yes. because that comes into that. And I just thought it was quite funny. It is actually quite sensible, according to Kathleen. Isn't okay, it? Thanks. For the thanks. head, vinegar and brown paper. She meant her, mended her head. Yeah, his head. Sorry. Sorry, I just... <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, 
just a look at this when we're talking about the, the you know the, the the bad old days. This was only last year. This is the reality now. You know the number of appointments for patients has fallen by a third. Dental deserts are emerging across England after two thousand dentists left the NHS. And just a little thing that I'd like to say, when you were last visiting the dentist, you know, uh, I was talking to my wife, she came back, she only needs a filling, so it's 60 odd pounds. Uh, if she'd needed a crown, it would have been nearly 300. Now, I just also found a statistic that 10 million people have savings of less than 100 pounds. So when they're walking around needing a filling or a crown or, you know, root treatment, then uh, you know, that is a major challenge. Now, I hope that many of these bring back uh, cosy memories. You'd reach for this, first of all, wouldn't you? Uh, what, certainly when I was a child, I remember many of these. You just nip to the corner shop and you'd come back with your Beecham's or Fenning's powder uh, or Vic. Gosh, I can remember the number of times I went to bed smelling of Vic. Um, so, but of course, the whole point of it is that they only tackle the symptoms. They sort of give you some measure of relief, but they're actually not touching uh, the cause of illness. Anybody, have I missed anything? Any favourites that I've overlooked? No, but Tom, I remember every week as a child, on a Sunday night after we've had tea, my mum made sure my sister and I had a Shore Shield tablet, which was similar to the x -Lax. I mean, I don't, she just gave it to us once a week. <laughs> and that had to do us for the whole week. It was horrible. <laughs> I remember they used to have those like little chocolate drops covered with hundreds and thousands. They oh, were horrible as well. Right. Now, I want people to try this. The reason why I want you to try it, Andy Simpson, is it's almost impossible to get. Can you identify these people? And they have got a shared health problem. Ooh. Well, <laughs> well, just identify one. I'll let you off with one. Well, the, the top left is Jenny, uh, the wife of Rosetti. Yes. The yes. Raphaelite model. Yeah. And the top middle is Florence Nightingale, is it? And then that's oh. Dickens. 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 Yeah. Uh, Shelley at the bottom. Yes. Right. Do they and Ophelia on, on the top, bottom left. Is it TP oh, or you can. These two are treasures of the City Art Gallery. I'm sure you'll have seen them. <laughs> That's by Rossetti and it's uh, Astarte. And that is Ophelia by Millet. And the, the, the stunningly beautiful model is Lizzie Siddle. That's Florence Nightingale, Charles Dickens, and this is Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Oh, Coleridge. Coleridge. And Samuel oh, Taylor, you know, Kublai Khan. He will, uh, he, he's the main clue. They were all addicts. addicts. You don't think of that when you talk about Florence Nightingale, do you? What's you that? Oh, sorry, I missed that. What are they addicted to? Were they addicted Opiates. to? Opiates. Opium. Uh, opiates, right. And uh, this is why. Because in the absence of anything else, you could go to the grocers, the pub, the barbers, the local sweet shop, and you could buy this, which is laudanum, which is almost pure opium. And when I read about this, it reminded me of cigarette smoking in the 50s and 60s. Nobody thought anything of it. It was a widely accepted social habit. And in the same way, anybody carrying that was just doing what thousands of people around them were doing. 
and you give a drop of laudanum to uh, an infant who was teething. If you had a headache, you'd knock back the, the uh, laudanum. A cough, rheumatism, diarrhea, depression, and women's troubles. Um, and again, just to look at some of the other patent medicines, again, soothing syrup with morphine for the baby on her lap, cocaine for toothache, French tonic wine, which sounds very, very genteel, and it was full of cocaine, coca leaves. And you can see the cough syrup there has got cannabis, chloroform, and morphia. <laughs> All totally acceptable. Now, this absolutely shocked me, this. This is now, this is now, as we're sitting here. I didn't find any photographs about it because it's too desperate to show you. There are, there are towns which are like ghost towns. There are people, hollowed out zombies. And it's basically the fentanyl epidemic, which is in uh, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, and British Columbia. And what's frightening about it is that, um, that they're worried that sooner or later it's going to come to Europe and this country. And fentanyl is 50 times stronger than morphine. And um, over the last two years in the States, they've lost 600,000 people, 10 times more than they lost in the Vietnam War to this. Uh, and the more you look into it, the more frightening it is. And again, just so you're not sort of sitting back feeling comfortable and glad you don't live in West Virginia, I read in the paper this morning that the NHS is trying to curb um, the prescriptions. Uh, one in four adults are on prescriptions for antidepression and the like. Um, and anyway, I think I've made my point, but... Um, in certain areas of these uh, states, more people died from fentanyl than from COVID, car accidents, cancer, and suicide combined. What's sad about this memorial here is there's a photograph of this young girl uh, graduating from high school. She, so she was about 18. So that photograph must have been pretty current. So her life was, was cut short. And I read this in a, in, in a book I read, and it's uh, Richard Reeves. And he says, opioids are taken simply to numb pain, perhaps physical at first, then existential. They are not drugs of inspiration or rebellion, but of isolation and retreat. Most of those states have just, they're like Rust Belt states. There's nothing going on there. Now, you have to unmute yourself now. Burns going to pick two people. That's the shape of my talk. Which two do you think are most important for good health? NHS. You're allowed Poverty. to, Bernard. Poverty, clean water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Clean water and poverty. Well, the opposite of poverty. All of them. Uh, okay. So it just sets the uh, scene for what I'm about to go into. Now, what I would like to just, this is really interesting. It's a uh, life expectancy. But just what's happened in your lifetime alone, that's what, what sort of got me, it's not going to be much of a maths lesson, by the way, but if you just look at what's happened whenever you were, you were born, life expectancy has, draw, uh, has, has risen by about 10 years. Okay? Yeah. Just let people have a look. You're talking the whole of the UK there, are you? Yes. 
Now, I know in some of these slides, uh, Bernard, we could have a half hour debate, but I'm <laughs> sorry, that's not allowed. I don't want to hear about Glasgow and Kensington. <laughs> right. This is, right. This is the stuff I think we take for granted. We do, we walk around, we take it for granted. Right. As a history teacher, I've never been one for time travel or stories of time travel. It's not wild and exciting and adventurous. No, it's very sordid and squalid. This is Manchester in the 1800s. This here in the top left is the Green Quarter at the end of Cheatham Hill Road, not far from Victoria Station. And it was there that uh, Engels described conditions as the vilest and most dangerous slum of the Industrial Revolution. If anyone wishes to see in how little space a human being can move, how little air he can breathe, how little of civilization he may share and yet live, it is only necessary to travel hither. These pictures here that I've banged on the slide at the bottom, they are incredibly glamorous. <laughs> They're just prettied up. <laughs> the actual conditions were far, far, far worse than anything we can imagine. I mean, look, that's quite comfortable, that middle room there, that middle cellar, it's got air and it's got light. Now, a journalist in 1849 said, the place was dark except for the glare of a small fire. You couldn't stand without stooping in the room which was 12 feet by eight. There were a dozen men, women and children on stools or squatted on the floor around the heat and the smells were oppressive. They slept huddled on the stones or on masses of rags, shavings and straw. There was nothing like a bed in the place. So there's your trip back in time. This is Dr. James K. Shuttleworth, who was the first um, director of health in 1832. And he's not exaggerating. He's simply describing the reality of the city, that the houses are ill-drained, ill-ventilated, and don't have toilets, don't have lavatories. The streets are narrow, unpaved. Uh, mud, refuse, and disgusting order. People are sick because of bad nutrition, cold, moisture, uncleanliness. Well, where were they going to wash and bath? Uh, pollution, hard work, exhaustion. God help you if you're about 40, 45, and you were looking for work. Um, drink. Fear, anxiety, diarrhoea, and so on. There was a lot of typhus, typhoid, and diarrhoea because of the dirt and filth. More than half of the offspring of the poor die before they're five. Um, and the children are proverbially pale and sallow. Uh, he, wasn't he wasn't campaigning as such. It was just his job to try and persuade people to actually spend some money on the city. <clears throat> this is fever and death. Now, this is a story you've probably not heard before, so lean back. Um, I don't know whether you know, but there are graveyards not far from Victoria Station and behind candles, and that's where the cholera victims are buried. And cholera struck in 1831 and 1849. I mean, it wasn't special to Manchester. It was hitting most of the industrial cities. Certainly it hit London and it hit the Northeast and the rest. And cholera is a vicious disease. Um, you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't smell it. It's just there in the water. And it basically is it, it, water contaminated with human waste. Um, and once you do get cholera, uh, you, you collapse and then you go into rapid dehydration, rapid dehydration. The colour of your nails changes, the pink disappears because basically the flesh is sinking in because it's dehydrated. 
your face collapses in on itself and your eyes go back into your socket. And then again, trying to put this delicately, your bowels just open and there's a wave as you try and lose as much of the fluid you have in your body as possible. So you will, it was rare to recover it, recover. Now they open, and the other thing about cholera, you know, it was truly disgraceful that the people in the carriages from Withington and Moss Side, they could catch it as well. You can't just pen, pen it away in all the slums where the poor were. There was a danger of um, the rich catching it. And this is a true story. They opened um, a special cholera hospital and four-year-old John Brogan got cholera and died. And he was buried at Walker's Croft, which is where Victoria Station is now, in a huge open pit. And after the grandfather discovered there was no name on the coffin, he asked to see the body to check it was young John. The coffin was opened and the boy was there all right, but with no head. This is all in the Manchester newspaper report. This isn't me titivating, putting a bit of uh, horror into it. This is just everyday reality. And in place of the head was a brick. And word spread quickly through the area known popularly as Irish Town. And locals were furious. And of course they'd be furious because doctors to them were uh, a subject of deep suspicion. Doctors didn't care about them, the poor. They were very unlikely to be seen. They were only seen as sinister scientists actually looking for corpses to practice on. The grandfather displayed the headless corpse to those who gathered and a mob attacked the hospital. They rioted, smashed the windows and attacked the staff. And it later turned out that the medical student had sawn off the head and sold it for research. So that says an awful lot about conditions in the city and the facilities that were available. This is, uh, Andy Simpson gave me this. It's just, uh, an, again, an object lesson. Obviously, it wasn't a hot, Manchester wasn't necessarily totally a play pit. As ever, if you were rich and comfortable and doing all right, then I'll just point to the Holt family, um, which Andy's written about there. Uh, they owned a lot of land in Chilton. And if you look at when they died, 84, 75, 77, 81, 80. Just a, a corrective in case you think everybody was staggering around looking ill. Now, these are some of the scenes that I grew up with. I'm sure many of you did as well. There's Bernard's favourite church, the Holy Name. <laughs> and uh, we can see that underneath the palace that we now call the Manchester Universities, that those high-rise, luxurious developments, this is how it used to look in 1968. Uh, and I've put that down because what struck me when I looked at this, obviously it was lovely to see these pictures and reminding me of, of parts of Manchester of my youth. But what struck me was where I put this red exclamation mark. In the 35 years after the Second World War, local authorities and housing associations built 4.4 million homes, social homes. Contrast and compare to the last 40 years. And this is what the National Housing Federation said in 2022. 8.4 million people are living in unaffordable, insecure, or unsuitable home. Now, this isn't a part of political broadcast, but how can you talk about health without recognizing this reality? Um, again, I threw that in parts of Widdenshaw. Uh, the ambition behind that scheme is breathtaking. We just take it for granted. I know Wigan Shore have got many problems, but what they did, they built the biggest council estate in Europe and contrast and compare with those photos of Upper Brook Street. And anyway, I just think the ambition of it all was uh, 
breathtaking. One of my favourite slides here is the one on the bottom left. It's a fountain in front of the town hall. Again, <clears throat> the courage and the boldness. They brought water 96 miles from Thirlmere to bubble out in front of Manchester Town Hall. And it was seen as a marvel of the Victorian era. And of course, the obvious things about the miles of sewers and the uh, wastewater treatment plant at Davy Hume. Do we ever give it a thought? And how grateful ought we to be for our good health because of all this? But again, challenging the fact that everything's sweetness and light. The Romans actually did it 2,000 years ago. This is Vindolanda, a very modest, out-of-the-way, remote fort on Hadrian's Wall. And that's what you'd get for about, well, the equivalent of about 20p today. You could just go into a bathhouse. Uh, they had a lavatory and, uh, where the waste was flushed away. That's Bath, of course. You might recognise the Pont du Gard, which brings uh, water down from the hills around Nîmes in southwest France. Now, you can probably guess why there's a roulette wheel here, but I'll prove it. Why I put it on there? The health of women and children. Again, this I found quite frightening. Right, the perils of pregnancy. The roulette wheel was because when you entered pregnancy, nobody knew what the outcome was going to be. These charms, amulets, they're present day. These, these aren't historic. These are what you can buy now. These are what you can buy on the web now. Pregnancy crystals for a safe labour and a good pregnancy. And... Maybe four or five thousand years ago, these were amulets in ancient Egypt of the ancient goddess of childbirth. Again, this is, is the world we live in now. Niger, a woman gives birth to an average of nearly eight children. And with every pregnancy and birth, a woman's risk increases. And basically, uh, pregnancy and childbirth are among the leading causes of death in developing countries. And I just thought that summed up history. It certainly sums up Victorian history for women. We hear pregnancy is considered so natural and childbirth is considered a part of life. But there's a real sense of complication and death. Now, I don't know whether any of these are among your favourite books. So we've got uh, Snow White, War and Peace, Oliver Twist, Wuthering Heights, Mary Barton, Harry Potter, Adam Dalgleish. And the common link is that all of their mothers died in childbirth. And that wasn't put in there as a sort of cheap drama. That was just put in as well, the reality of the life that was being lived. Everybody recognised it. Again, another slide that you could stare at for 20 minutes, which is, this is uh, Andy Simpson. You see he's laid claim to it there, so I can't use it. <laughs> Andy Simpson found this um, tombstone in St. Michael's Church, Ashton on the line. And what I was trying to work out, we haven't got time to work out, was how many of these children were alive at the same time? Not many. So Charles Sharp, he had two wives, and the Elizabeth had George, who died at eight months, and then Hannah lived through the succession of tragedies. I mean, she managed to hold on to Thomas for 18 years. But again, the reality, unremarked upon, because it was just part of life. In the midst of life, we are in death. And that's the present day care for, well, uh, antenatal care. Again, something we could study, study, study. Um, 
the death rate uh, for maternal mortality up to 1970. But you know what frightens me is that I was looking at 1940 here. And if you think of a typical primary school assembly, let's say uh, Brookburn, a fairly small uh, primary school, and you have the hall full of infants and juniors, what I worked out was there would still be about five girls who would die in childbirth out of that assembly. And uh, obviously the key to uh, the improvement is all of those things, antiseptics, antibiotics, but contraception is key. And of course, this does not necessarily true in the developing world, where a million mothers a year still die. Frightening stuff. Now, I hope Helen's got a pen here, pen and paper, because this is the, you know, these things never go away, do they? You think, oh, history, that's how it used to be. Well, it still is, matey. You've got the pro-choice and the pro-life. And how many lives have been changed by the Supreme Court recently? And the reason why I want Bernard or Helen to write this down is that I found a really lovely, lovely film on BBC iPlayer. And it's called Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always. And it is and you will enjoy it. It's about an hour and a half. It is not polemical. It's very low key and every day. And it's just totally rooted in reality. This girl here is 17. She lives in Philadelphia and she finds that she's pregnant. She's got hardly any money and she has somehow to get to New York to get the problem sorted. Um, People who watched it, you know, the Rotten Tomato site where people give film reviews, ordinary people give film reviews, 99% gave five stars to this. So some of you might uh, thank me if, uh, once you've watched that film. It's really good film. Oh, so sorry. I don't know what I've done there. Right, hold on. Oh, God, right. Now, keeping up with the fairy tale scheme, we're going to go into children, the lives of children. This is uh, Annie, who was the daughter of Charles Darwin. And the poor girl died at 10 of tuberculosis, and her parents were devastated. But by the mid-19th century, tuberculosis killed 60,000 children a year. I've done it again, haven't I? Right, what have I done? Only you know that, Tom. Wait a minute. Right, now, I'm sorry, there's a lot of text here. I'll just pick out the obvious things. Certainly in the light of COVID and vaccination, Victorian children were just polished off by smallpox, measles, whooping cough, diphtheria and dysentery. Archibald Tate, a future Archbishop of Canterbury, he lost five children in five weeks to scarlet fever. How sad. Um, there are the Brontes. Just a reminder that Charlotte was the longest lived at 38. All of them. TB. Just in the Victorian age in Liverpool, basically uh, working class districts, they lost one in four children. If you lived in the worst slums, you lost one in two. Uh, and that's just a repeat of the infectious diseases. And, of course, key factors in this was piped water and vaccination. Now we come to the present day. 
This again is one of my favourite slides. I could stare at this for ages and ages and ages. I want you to think of 13-year-old children or your own kids when they were 13. They'd be in what, year, year eight at Chilton High School, say. And uh, they're obviously growing, aren't they? They're growing. In 1913, they would be ready to go into the factories and offices and shops as soon as they were 14. Not on a summer holiday. As soon as they were 14, they walked out of that school. So these kids who were 13 uh, were just literally weeks away from going into the world of work. And for those of you who, who struggle with the measurements, like me, I put all this into uh, imperial measurements. And when you look at uh, the figures, what becomes very apparent is that these were, they were 13, but they were little children. You could have lined up a class of these 13-year-olds and you could have led them into a primary, a modern primary school assembly and sat down, sat them down, and they wouldn't stand out at all. You could have led a team of 13-year-old lads or girls out to play football on the primary school pitch, and they would not be any different at all. So when you stare at it, the differences are marked. Oh, and also... They are very much little boys and girls. They're not into puberty. Um, you can see here that a medium class girl is four, four foot six compared to her modern day equivalent of five foot one. Boy. Uh, middle, medium boy, middle class boy, same thing, uh, beg your pardon, four foot six compared to five foot one. Now, and I've just, I put all of this, again, you can look at the recording if you want to study it. I can see your, your brow is wrinkled, uh, Bernard. If you want to study it, you can look at the recording. And all of this is very ironic, considering that today, obesity is a sign of poverty. Oh, and today, a 10-year-old would be as, uh, as tall as those 13-year-olds were. I bet you all recognise these photos, don't you? You know Shirley Baker went round in the 60s and she took photos of inner city Manchester and Salford. And he is at one. But the thing that jumps out of this photo is they're all a bit rough and ready, aren't they? But they are sturdy, aren't they? They're strong. And they're trim. That's down to the welfare state, the NHS, school milk and school dinners. It's interesting, that. Yeah. And again, good health. Well, this is the health problem that faces us today. Um, today, more than 95% is caused by food choice, toxic food ingredients, nutritional deficiencies, and lack of physical exercise. This is the Manchester Obesity Plan. Two thirds of adults and 41% of children, 10 or 11, are overweight or obese. There are several food deserts where you can't find good quality fresh food. Uh, I've just found these quotes. As for food, half of my friends have dug their graves with their teeth. The food you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. And here's another quote. This is what people don't understand. Obesity is a symptom of poverty. It's not a lifestyle choice where people are just eating and not exercising. It's because kids are getting sugar, fat, empty calories, but no nutrition. 
And those are ju that's just the level of recommended p uh, physical activity and the reality. Right, I'm speeding up a bit here, Bernard. Is that okay? No, take your time. Right, okay. Now, we're stopping here because I don't want to be patronising. I don't want to be sort of thinking, oh, look at what's happening to those other people. <laughs> look at their poor health. And I'm just asking everybody to have a minute or two. I'm going to stop. The relief, you, to your relief, I'm going to stop for a while. And I want you to talk to yourselves in your head and ask yourself these questions about your own well-being. This is a poster for primary school kids. And it's about your sense of well-being. So these are the ingredients. Physical, are you looking after yourself? Are you still using, exercising your faculties as you are able? Nothing unrealistic, just what you're comfortable doing, but doing what you know you should do, getting enough sleep, walking, um, healthy food. Emotional, that's uh, good. Uh, it's forgiveness, compassion, kindness, not churning yourself up with regrets and negativity. Social, going out and mixing in social, well, coming to good neighbours for a start, but social, other people keep us healthy. And spiritual, the things unseen as well as the scene, whatever that means to you. That can mean religion or meditation or literature or art or nature. But there's the mix. I'll pause just for a minute and you can give yourself a score for each of those and make up a couple of resolutions for yourself. Maybe make sure you're not deficient in any of those. Sorry, I'm going to go on to the next slide, which is basically repeats this. So bear with me. Just obviously that's, uh, we, we have got help if we need it, basically. Now, there is a queue at the Salvation Army. Those kids are hungry. Here are the first school meals. That's a minister in 1934 campaigning for free school milk. Does it all seem quite quaint now? Too corporate. Nanny state. And here's today. You can always tell if a child has eaten breakfast, they concentrate better in class and behave better, says Stockport Head. St. Bernadette's Primary runs a breakfast club for 80 children each day. And 750 teachers uh, polled for Kellogg's, which sponsors 3,000 clubs. Two-fifths are equally worried. Uh, Kellogg's commissioned the poll to question teachers in schools with breakfast clubs. Of those who responded, 43% feared they could close. <coughs> And that's 10 years ago. But again, what jumps out is that, you know, the children who live in a single parent family uh, and the two thirds of working age households who have somebody with a job but are still in poverty. Right, I'll go through the next section and then I'll draw gently to a close. Now, toothache. Toothache. Just think about toothache. Think about what I said about dentists and being able to afford to go. About looking for super glue, put your crown back in, or just, uh, you know, putting up with uh, a cavity. And toothache, apart from being worn down with the pain uh, and the decay, the bad taste in your mouth, the difficulty with chewing food and digesting it, is you feel run down. You get infections a lot, gum infections. You get a weaker immune system. 
Uh, and again, when the NHS came along, just to remind you there, little piece of nostalgia, when there was no uh, no uh, and needles before they did your filling, so that's 1940-odd. Um, dentistry was still so expensive that some people had all their teeth pulled out. I'm sure we know people who did that. I think sometimes it was a, a present for your 21st birthday. They pull your teeth out. Uh, when the NHS came along in 1948, four million cavities were filled and queues formed outside surgeries down the street. 33 million sets of dentures were prescribed in the early years. That just tells you the scale of the need. It's not everybody's rushing to get something for nothing. That is what they were living with, that they just put up with. Um, same story with opticians. People just put up with the fact that once you were knocking on about 45, your eyes started to fade. And in the early years of the NHS, seven and a half million pairs of specs were prescribed. And there was an 18 month waiting list. Just to remind you of the good news, six in one vaccine. Compare that to some of the stories from Victorian times. The BCG against TB. Now, I think I'm nearly finished. If you look at this, there's your quiz and you can unmute. Identify why these are pioneer patients. Any of these. Unmute everybody. We were had was here was the first heart transplant in uh, South Af South Africa. Yeah, with Christian Barnard. Yes, tick. Albert yeah. Alexander was the penicillin experiment. He was, which he was the, the first it was to the first that they administered penicillin. He began to pull round, and it's really sad because they couldn't keep up with the production, and so he died. So he proved that penicillin had value, but they couldn't. They hadn't cracked the production of it. Louise was the Louise first Brown. IVF baby. First, first test tube baby. Yeah, yeah. First, first test tube baby. Any of us? Maggie Keenan. She was the first COVID jab. Very good. I'm very impressed. You're all uh, passing the exam so far. Nobody will get these, so I'll move on. I didn't know oh. before I found them. There's the answers. He had gene therapy in 1990. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Watson um, had a, his prostate out by a robot. Shape of things to come. Oh. Right, I think I will... Well, hold on. There are only... Sorry, there you go. You can read. There are only two ways to live your life. One is though nothing is a miracle. The, the other is though everything is a miracle. That was Albert Einstein. And there's Buddha's wisdom. Health is the greatest gift. Now, I'm going to stop there. I'm just going to find one more slide for Bernard. <laughs> right, there you go. I found this because Bernard was showing off that he's had his cataracts done. <laughs> And uh, as it, though some of you will know that on the old, uh, near All Saints, just behind the, uh, the, the College of Art, uh, there's this pub, the Salutation. But at the time, uh, Charlotte Bronte brought her father, Patrick, to have his cataracts cut away. Uh, and he just had to lay down in this darkened room where three surgeons sort of uh, scraped his eyelids. <laughs> And, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, his eyeballs. And uh, oh, yeah. then he had to stay in that dark room without moving for four days. And it was successful. But I just yeah. thought I'd uh, sort of, one, prove that Charlotte Bronze had been in the pub, and two, just to, uh, you know, relive old times for Bernard. <laughs> so... 
<laughs> I'll stop there, I think. Yeah. OK, Sorry. we could give a ragged round of applause for what was, I thought, a brilliant speech. Thank you. Thank you. To, to Tom there, and he was talking about Angel Meadow and Angle describing how awful it was around there, sanitation and all the rest of it. But I'm 90, 90 years of age. I was the youngest of a, a family. My mother had nine children and I was the youngest. I was brought up in Angel Meadow. I was born in Angel Meadow in 1932 under those conditions. And it always makes me wonder why did I live to such a good age as 90? <laughs> With all those things uh, not going for me, it, it makes you wonder, how do you, is it the look of the draw? Does, does God say you're going to live or whatever? Thank you again, Tom. I thought oh. that was really brilliant, actually. It really had a bit of life to it and energy. It was, it was fantastic. Thank you.